Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Imeko. Um, almost two years, two months. Jeez, it's not. It hasn't been that long. Don't worry. Uh, two months after the last one. Uh, it has been a while. I took a little break from streaming, and uh, yeah, here we are. I'm back now. Yay! And hopefully, I will remember all of the voices. But who knows? <laughs> um, gosh. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Kat, how are you doing? Thank you for being here once again. Um, I will start us off, as always, with our content warning. Content warning for Imineko. Erica, twice over because she is a terrible character. Well, terrible person. She's a great character. Terrible person who does terrible things. And she's mean to uh, our favorite robot child bishop, the Lenor A. Knox. And yeah, she sucks, but we love her because she sucks. Also, character deaths. Detailed descriptions of gore and body horror child abuse, and discussions and mention of suicide, and misogyny. And, uh... Let me just go bop the game on, actually. So we have some nice, you know, seagull noises in the background. As is our uh, tradition. Because that's just what the uh, starting menu sounds like in these games. Then I'm going to do a little recap so that you can all be caught up in what happened so far. And then we can start and pray to any and all gods that I remember how the voices go. I probably will not, but you know what? We're gonna wing it. Get it winging it because seagulls. Sorry. Also, there are no seagulls. <laughs> Only the depressing howling of the wind. I did make a pun. That's yeah, there's one one per stream is my maximum. I'm not allowed any puns anymore. That's all I can take. Uh, yeah, I probably summoned Vape just by doing that. Honestly. If not, I, I hope he's having a good day and making a lot of puns. All right. As for our recap, on our last episode, um, Battler had a bit of a a bit of a rough day. He created this new Beatrice to essentially replace, or, well, he attempted to revive the old Beatrice. And that resulted in him creating a new one without the original's memories, because you can't revive a soul. Uh, then to cope with his loss, I guess is the best way to put it, um, and his disappointment and frustration, he... A little bit lashed out at the new Beatrice. Um, was quite rude to her, actually. And then started talking to uh, a more accurate, but ultimately fake, version of Beatrice that he essentially created and controlled with his own mind. Basically pretending to talk to her. And uh, that's kind of where we left him. Then, um, the trial that it's been talked about a couple of times, uh, started. George, Jessica, Conan, and Shannon were all summoned to some location off the game board, most likely. And told that to, uh, make their love flourish and to win the right to love, they have to play a game and win. Only one couple can win this game, and the others, the losers, will not see their love flourish, uh, come to fruition, it'll just die. 
um, Zeppar and Furfur, two demons, show up and act as game show hosts and, you know, people who explain what the rules of the game are. And also explain... Uh, hold on, I'm going out of order here. Let's not go there yet. They, they also invite in um, the new Beatrice to join in as a third pair with her older sister that she's been sort of going on this journey of discovery with. Uh, the older sister I haven't mentioned yet, but she was in an older episode. Um, they've been, you know, she's been talking to the sort of the legendary version of Beatrice, you know, the, the witch of the forest version. And if you'll recall, this is also the person who instigated this love triangle by giving Shannon and Kanon the butterfly brooch, which would guarantee that their love would uh, flourish. But only one, because there's only one brooch. Then, um, I should clarify that the new Beatrice joins in on this love triangle, not necessarily to win love, but to become, like, t to merge with her other self. That's her intent, I believe. So she basically wants to become the, the old Beatrice by somehow regaining her memories. Then, uh, Erica and Lenor argue about the nature of love and how to prove that you, in fact, do love someone. Uh, Erica wins by kind of being a creepy stalker and having essentially a lot of proof that someone cheated on her. Though Dlanor argues that that doesn't prove that someone doesn't love you. Um, she also points out that the red truth doesn't exist in the human world, so relying on it doesn't really get you anywhere. Then finally, Ava and George uh, talk about his engagement to Shannon, and it results as expected in an argument. During this argument, Ava turns into Ava Beatrice. Uh, they argue some more, they fight. Uh, Ava says some really creepy shit. And this f fight results in George killing his mother. Gap shows up and approves because, you know, she's hardcore like that. And then it is revealed that in this love tri trial, not triangle. To win the right to love, you have to kill someone on the game board. And if nobody else steps in, George will win by default. So if the others refuse to participate, George and Shannon will win, and the other couples will lose. So yeah, um, I hope that made sense. It was a bit long-winded, and I should have probably rewritten it a little bit to make more sense, but there you have it. I did my best. <laughs> Long story short, everything's kind of a big mess right now, and nobody's having a good time. It happens. If Ape was stuck in a tower, he'd be Rapunzel. Oh my god. It's true, it would be. Alright, I gotta... I forgot something. I will take a break in a bit. Um, cause normally I have like... Stuff for my throat. Cause reading is hard for the vocal cords. Uh, and I forgot to get those, so I'll have to get up in a bit, but that's fine. I have some nice warm tea right now, and for now that'll do. Ooh. We're starting off with Jessica, whose voice, I, I don't remember how I did that. So we're just gonna have to roll with it. Because if you'll recall, uh, if nobody steps in for this love trial, George wins. Wait! As the demons delightedly named George as the victor, they are interrupted by the next challenger. Jessica, son. 
I'll go next. Fine. I'm game. I'll show you that my feelings for Kano Kun aren't just a, just a silly childish crush. What if indeed? I genuinely last time stopped playing two seconds, like two sentences before the end of the chapter. <laughs> oh no. Just for the juicy, juicy cliffhanger. Sorry. You can't believe I do this? It's, yeah. It, it's how I roll. As usual, this year's family conference was getting bogged down. Everyone had decided to cool their heads for a moment, and a short break had been agreed upon. The four siblings could say whatever they wanted, but Natsuhi and Kirie, for example, were outsiders and found it difficult to speak freely in this sort of atmosphere. A conference where you aren't allowed to say what you want can be tiring even as you just sit there quietly. Even Kirie couldn't help letting out a deep sigh. This was the second floor hallway of the mansion. Rudolph had wanted to be alone during the break, so she had felt like doing the same. And had drifted up the stairs to reach this place. Her expression was less tightly controlled than it was when her husband was around. Kitty wore a tired look that she didn't often show. She pressed her forehead against the cool window glass. I need to regain my spirit and support my husband. Even if I'm not allowed to speak. That's the duty I've won. Who is it? She suddenly sensed another person, turned around, and saw Jessica standing at the other end of the hallway. Oh, it's you, Jessica-chan. Didn't you go to the guest house? Well, I just decided to head back to my own room for a bit to get a book. I see. And now you're on your way back to the guest house? Yes. That's right. What horrible rain. Is the wind really strong? It's weak right now, relatively speaking. As Kitty looked out the window, Jessica watched her back looking agitated. Aunt Kitty. I'm sorry, you just had bad luck. Ah, <sighs> Zephar. Jessica's roulette to fate has chosen Kitty. What will you do, Jessica? The roulette has chosen Kitty, but you may reject that choice and spin the roulette again if you wish. It doesn't matter whose life is sacri sacrificed for this trial. Jessica wasn't like George. George had willingly chosen Ava to be his sacrifice. To signify his separation from his old life so that it could step into a new life married to Shannon. However, Jessica hadn't thought of any particular target. So she had left it up to the roulette of fate. That roulette was nothing very grandiose. She had simply walked around at random, imposing a rule on herself saying that the first person she met would be chosen as the sacrifice. And so, the roulette of fate had brought her to Kitty. Of course, there was nothing forcing her to keep to that rule. However, it was the rule that she had decided upon and she didn't want to break it now. Now that she was participating in this demon's game, 
This was the one bit of justice that she could cling to. Right now, she could attack that unprotected back. But Jessica still wasn't able to fully resolve herself. What is it? Do you have something to say to me? Noticing Jessica's strange silence, Kitty had turned around. That unprotected back was already gone. Jessica realized that her hesitation had cost her her own first chance. She had taken on this demon's game to prove her love for Kalman. However, would it re really be alright to sell her soul to demons for the sake of love? Not wanting to let George, who had already come to terms with the situation, get any more of a lead on her, she had energetically consented to this demon's game, but her heart still wasn't ready. Um, maybe I shouldn't be asking you this, Aunt Kitty. What is it? It's rare for you to ask me questions, Jessica Chum. I hope I'm capable of answering it for you. Uh, actually, I... Have someone I like. Oh, really? That's wonderful. <laughs> then is it love you wanted to talk about? <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. Alright. I'll help out if I can. Th thank you very much. Uh, actually, um... Is it still one-sided? No, I guess you could say that it's just become mutual. Uh, but, well, there's this trial for us to be joined together. A trial? What are you talking about? There's the two of us and another pair of lovers and we have to fight each other. A love triangle? Or a love rectangle? Sounds complicated. And? Only the pair who wins can be together. It's something complicated like that. So it's like, um... <laughs> Sounds nasty. Love that it can only succeed at another couple's expense. Yes. If we join up, then they'll fall apart. And the same the other way around. I think I see where you're going with this. Something like this, right? To what extent is a person allowed to climb over others in their own pursuit of happiness, right? It was once again apparent just how smart Kiria was. She immediately figured out the question that Jessica wants to ask most. If you don't fight, it automatically means that they win and you lose. However, if you do fight and win, you cause the other pair to break apart. It's nasty either way. But the answer is obvious. Yes. Kitty giggled. If she wasn't willing to commit to her love, then that would show the measure of their relationship. If that was the case, she should just let the other pair of lovers win. However, if this was a love that she couldn't abandon, she couldn't abandon the victory either. So she had no option but to fight. In the end, Jessica's hesitation was caused by guilt, over forcing the others to split apart as the result of her inevitable dis decision. I guess I'm just being soft after all. Yep. That you are. But stepping over someone else for the sake of my own love, it feels horrible. In that case, 
What about the one you love? Will you give up on them? That's... I can tell you one thing for certain. Doing that would feel even worse. You'll be forced to crawl through hell for the rest of your life. Hey, Lulu, welcome. Thank you for lurking. Hope you're having a good day. The hardness had entered Kitty's gaze. I was just sick, so I didn't understand much about it at the time. But I found Mom's notebook among her belongings after she died. What did feathering sound like? It, what did feather? Oh no! I can't remember. <sighs> okay, so it's like old board witch. I could, I got this. Was it a diary? It was more a collection of her thoughts. It was much less organized than a diary would have been. Yeah, she did sound like a know-it-all. Because she is. <laughs> or she's supposed to sound like a know-it-all, I don't know if I managed, but apparently... Uh, I did okay. I found it and read it right after she passed away. But I needed to wait a long time, until I'd grown for several years before I could understand it. I see. So, did it speak of Kitty's worries about her marriage? It was practically a book of curses. cleared up several things that six-year-old me had always vaguely sensed. When I was six, it seemed as though my parents were very close and had no problems. And though I did think it odd that Oni-chan lived separately when he was meant to be part of our family, and I did wonder why he only came home every once in a while, I accepted it as the way things were. Did you not know about Azumu? I... I think Onichan talked to me about her when no one was around, but there was no way an elementary schooler like me, like I was, like I was, could understand. After all, I never even saw a picture of her. Mom had sent all of the pictures with Azumu-san in them to Onichan, leaving none behind in the house. In front of Anche, and even in front of Battler, who only rarely came home, Kitty's smile never faltered. If she hadn't written her, written her thoughts in that notebook, Anja would probably never have known them. Rudolph had been particularly popular, popular with the opposite sex since his school days, a typical playboy. Audacious, over the top, and yet not lacking a little gentleness towards women. He'd probably built up a formula for getting women to like him. Plenty of women approached him, using various seductive tricks to try to win his favor. Rudolph probably enjoyed that more than anyone. Since the beginning, love had been a game to Rudolph. He never thought of it as a trial and error process to find a single life partner. He would intentionally spark jealousy between women and revel in the harem, lapping up their flirting. He may be my father, but he was an awful man. But at the same time, Dad must have looked down on those must have looked down on those toady and girls. Mom, who had her own set of values and was extremely intelligent, must have stood out. Though even that might have been due to the skillful way Kitty had tried to catch Rudolph's gaze. Maybe. Mom was smart in many ways. Like the other Ushirumiya siblings, Rudolph had strong ambitions and lofty goals. 
one of the mottos of who dares wins and it's not a crime if you don't get caught. He would set up businesses that were borderline swindles or bending the law, then bail out of them, and repeat that process over and over. Apparently, he was already making use of that talent in his college years, cleverly making money by thinking up shameless projects and selling cheap tickets to parties for them. So much money that he could brag about how his wallet was always stuffed with 110,000 yen notes. That's a lot of money. Especially back then. Many women fell for his charisma and being the man responsible the man responsible for these radical pro radical projects, as well as his thick wallet and generosity. It would be a lie to say that Kiria was not one of them. However, what made Kiria very different from the other women was that she could also support Rudolph as a business partner. Rudolph would laugh all the way to the bank as his large-scale party succeeded. His female entourage would surround him, and Kirie would be the only one among them, able to calmly point out several ways that income and expenditure could be improved upon, and even lay out a proposal for the next project. In that manner, Rudolph must have slowly begun to accept her as a partner. Just like some people say men don't belong in the kitchen. There's also a sense that women should stay out of financial affairs. It's normal for women to be treated by men. The details of how those 10,000 yen notes were scrounged up are vulgar, so they don't ask, don't know, don't even care. So you're saying that Kitty viewed money from a man's perspective. In that regard, Rudolf noticed something unique about Kiria. He knew all about how much hard work it took to make just one of those 10,000 yen notes. So somewhere inside him, he looked down upon these, those extravagant women who never even considered the efforts he had undertaken. Among all of them, only Kiria possessed the same sharp financial intuition as Rudolf. Every time Rudolf thought of a new plan, he would talk to Kitty about it, work out the kinks, and make it succeed. In this way, Kitty steadily worked her way up until she was the number one of Rudolf's large group of followers. But Mom was still a woman. I doubt she enjoyed seeing Dad pampered by all the other girls. So, she would rather have been his only one instead of his number one. Yeah. Though she served as Dad's right hand, she slightly got rid of the other women in the shadows. It was only a matter of time before Mom would succeed in her love. When did Azumu come into the picture? Alright, I think this is a good place to take a bit of a break. Because I'm already feeling the ow from the talkie. <laughs> I mean... I am out of practice is what I mean, and I need a quick break. I will be right back. Alrighty. Alright, alright, I should be good to go now. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a while until I'm back in like proper form, I think. <laughs> oh boy. This is just like uh, back in the day when I started on uh, episode one. How, how, how far we've come, honestly, because it's more than a year later, you know? Hell, it's almost a year and a half later because, uh, again, two weeks two month break. So we are running behind my schedule, but that's okay. Actually, you know what? If I drag this out, um, the, what is essentially the ninth episode might be out and translated by then. 
So the, the longer this takes, the higher the odds are that we could just immediately go and do more I mean, Echo. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yes, that is a, a fully new game. Uh, a new game board and everything. Um, I hear there's new characters, which will be fun for the voice acting part. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know anything about it. I've managed to avoid all spoilers so far, which is pretty easy because, you know, it's it hasn't been translated yet. So yeah, um, once that comes out, we are definitely 100% dropping whatever the hell I'm doing then, and we're gonna read. Alright, I'm gonna read that, and it's gonna be great. I'll give my avatar a little makeover, and uh, yeah. Cause he needs- he could, he could use a little bit of work. I'm already seeing some areas I can improve. Anyway, back to Azumi, uh, Battler's mom. She was one of those who swarmed around Budo-san. the wrong window. No, not even that. She was just one of his fans. Did you ever talk with her? Of course. I knew her well. Ever since the very beginning, before Rudolph san even knew her name. I'm sure she was quite intel intelligent herself. And cunning. I tried to use my intelligence to stick out, but she took the exact opposite approach. By her... stupidity? <laughs> I mean, she was good at triggering his protective instinct. Out of all the girls who came to flatter and flirt with him, only she stood out with every action she made, unlike the flashy girls but also had tired of. Even now, Kiria recognized the mistake she had made in letting Azumu and Rudolph get too close. Kiria had thought that by taking the role of his business partner, she had succeeded in making him entirely hers. She might have been a little conceited. And her arrogance in trying to eliminate the relationships the other girls had with Rudolph might also have contributed. Perhaps she sometimes tried too hard as a business partner, putting too much pressure on him, regardless of the fact that it was justified. Bit by bit, Rudolph started to need a woman who could stay quiet and soothe him, without making him think about anything complicated. Kiria, you queen, you are too good for this man. You are too good for this man. I mean, you're also like really vindictive and spiteful, but... That's not a bad trait. That doesn't have to be a bad trait. Like, how you handle it is what matters, you know? And she handles it like she puts a smile on her face and she looks after her kid and... Her stepkid, you know? Doesn't let any of that show. Just writes it in a book. That's all she did. <sighs> oh, she's she's all of that. She's nice and cheerful and also cunning and deceitful, but like... I mean... I mean, she grew up in, you know... What seems to be like a Yakuza type family. She probably had to do that just to survive. Like her sister's super fucked up. It, you know? And she kind of focuses most of her cunning and deceit on like... Chasing after a... like a mediocre guy. There are worse things in the world. Oof. I don't know, I just felt really bad for all of us. <laughs> anyway. That woman was Azumi.
I am ruthless and intellectual, rational and economical. In a plank of Cardiades situation, I would push the other person off without hesitation. I'm gonna Google that. Hold on. I moved my notebook. This was a big mistake. Why did I do that? Don't have a pen. I'm so sorry. Normally I try to do this like really sneakily, but I moved all my stuff. It does sound Greek. Um, it's probably a philosophy thing. This is a new one to me. I, this was not in the uh, Introduction to Philosophy book that I read when I would hide in the library to avoid getting bullied at school. So that'll be fun to read about later. <laughs> I didn't get bullied because I hid in the library. Thank you. It's, it's, I lie, I got super bullied. Not anymore, though. I, I should have beaten people with books, though, you're right. Books are so useful. <laughs> anyway, back to Kitty. I thought that was the kind of partner suitable for him. However, though that ruthlessness had made her reliable on the business side of things, outside of business, it might have disturbed Rudolf deeply. At some point, though Rudolf still acknowledged Kitty's skill, he began to yearn for a quiet, warm acceptance. Azumu filled that role completely. She would never talk about anything complicated. Even if he did, she would just shake her head to say she didn't know. However, she would care more for him physically than anything than anyone else, quietly putting a blanket on him and staying by his side until morning. Yes, I did get the position of his business partner. But before I knew it, Rudolph's son had grown a need for a mental partner, someone who could heal his heart. Foolishly enough, despite claiming to be the intellectual one, I never noticed. And then... And then... Uncle Rudolph married Aunt Azumi. Yes, that's right. She stole him away from me. He had slept with a lot of women. By that point, he wasn't the kind of guy to let his emotions be captured by a woman just because he slept with her. After all, sleeping with women was just a game to him. That's why I used something other than my body to attract his attention. Conceit. A woman's downfall. Before long, they were both pregnant. Azumu san told Dad about it right away, but Mom did the opposite. She must have been afraid that pregnancy would threaten her position as his business partner. Apparently, Mom wasn't eating much at the time and was often out of sorts. Because of that, it took a really long time before she realized she was pregnant. When did she notice? It was after Azumu-san suddenly moved into Dad's fa family register. Mom learned about her pregnancy after that and plotted several times to split Azumu-san and Dad apart, but... Even though Azumu-san always appeared to be so absent-minded, once she got her hands on Rudolf-san, she wouldn't let go. What do you want? Please stay out of our way should say. And this coming from that sissy little girl who'd curl up into a ball every time every time she got on a bus. At that point, I realized 
she had been the truly cunning one. Yes, even her fear of vehicles was another lie to catch Widow-san's sympathy. <sighs> My apologies. I must be boring you. Uh, oh, no. At the very least, I wanted him to register himself as the father of my child. And it does seem as though Rudolfson was prepared to do that. He made sure there was a hospital waiting for me. And even though Azumi-san was close to giving birth herself, he gallantly came to see me. Even though she was already his wife. <laughs> what an awful man, really. After that, is the tale I can't bear even to tell. Both Asumu and I had the same delivery date, and yet her pregnancy led to marriage, while mine was completely meaningless. I swore to bring up my child well, so that Rulofsan would be proud to call himself its father. Asumu-san had won her battle against me. However, I hadn't yet lost the war. If I could make my child excel far more than Azumi-san's. If I could make my child the one that Rudolf-san most respected, I would be rewarded. That's what I believed. However, Kitty's child was stillborn. Yeah. Azumi-san gave birth to Anichan. But Mom didn't give birth to anyone. Even Mom's final hope of being left a spot as Dad's second wife was destroyed. Kitty had fallen from his, his partner to his second one, and then, unable to give birth to the bond of a child, she tumbled down to merely being his mistress. I can't imagine how much she must have hated Azumu and her child, battling. But despite that, Mom was able to act in a very friendly way towards Onichan. It was definitely a shock to me to discover that my kind and gentle mother had held such negative emotions towards Onichan and managed to hide them. She must have despised Battler. I don't doubt it. If Azumu-san's child had been stillborn and Mom had been the one to give birth to Anichan, history might have changed in some way. It seems she thought that if that had happened, she might have been able to make things play out in a way that Dad would divorce Azumu-san and marry her instead. Was that also written in that book where she kept her thoughts? Yeah. It was truly a... It truly was a collection of random thoughts, fantasies. Mom's resentment as she chewed on the corner of her tear-stained tear bedsheet. There's just one thing I regret. You mean... the pregnancy? No, no. It's my arrogance I regret. Rudolf son is, son is complete, already mine, so I'm completely safe. I'll never lose to that Azumi girl. While she was screaming and shrieking on buses and planes, I was capable of properly managing the travel arrangements and expenditures. And so I was overly confident that I was the one Rudolf son trusted the most. They say love needs to be nurtured, right? Yeah. That's not wrong. You both need to water that tree, care for it, and nurture it. And at the end, it will finally bear the fruit called love. Did you know? It isn't over when it bears fruit. You have to harvest that love, or it will never be realized. Harvest? You need to think about that yourself, Jessica-chan. 
If you make the tree bear fruit without harvesting, it can sometimes grow rotten, and bugs will often gather around it. In fact, sometimes these will come by and pluck it off the branch. Young kids like you, Jessica Chan, think that love ends with nurturing. That's naive. If you don't harvest it, you will never be rewarded for your love. Harvest love. At a glance, it may seem to be a matter just for the pair of lovers, but that isn't true. Putting off the harvest because you assume you can do it at any time just gives the thieves a chance. What if that fruit you've worked so hard to nurture gets pulled off the branch the next morning? You'll regret that you didn't choose to harvest it the previous day instead of putting it off. And that regret really hurts. It'll make you crawl through hell. I was lucky. My hell ended after 18 years. So, I'll never misjudge myself again. That man is mine. I won't let him get away. I won't let him out of my sight. And I'm grateful to my masters for giving me that chance. My absolute certain willpower in not giving up on that man no matter what was answered with a miracle. By now, Jessica was speechless and didn't even nod her head in understanding. This true form of love that Kitty was telling her about was far, far more harsh than anything she had imagined. Now, I will do anything to keep Udo Sun by my side, and I will show no mercy to his enemies. If he wished it, I might not even hesitate to commit murder. Because I finally gained that determination on the 18th year, that absolute willpower brought about a miracle for me. You know, miracles only come to those who can make them come true themselves. Asumu's death was no murder. However, Kiria had often cursed her and hoped for her death. And finally, on the 18th year, she built up the determination to kill her with her own hands. And then, she actually got herself a knife with which to do the deed. This was when the miracle occurred. Aunt Asumu passing away was a miracle? That wasn't even close to a miracle. Uh, huh? After all, if she hadn't died, I would have killed her. In other words, she was fated to die no matter what. And the miracle was that, even though she did die, I didn't have to get my hands dirty. That's all. Oop. Until now, Kitty had never shown Jessica, no, she had never even shown Rudolph, that glint in the deepest depths of her eyes. Hey Ghosty, welcome to the stream, hope you're doing good. This might be a good time to uh, repeat our content warning. Uh, content warning for Emineko, Erika, because she sucks but we love her anyway. Um, character deaths, detailed descriptions of gore and body horror. Child abuse and discussions and mentions of suicide uh, and also misogyny. There's a lot of that going on. Uh, yeah, hi Ghosty, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I, I've been, I took a little break from streaming and I'm back now. Doing much better than, uh, than a while ago. Doing very good even. I'm also really glad that you were doing well. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, Kitty is scary. Um, 
but I have to admit, she is one of my favorites, and, you know, big part of me goes, yes, queen, whenever she's like, yeah, I would kill a person. <laughs> I can't help it. She's just, she's just so fucking cool. I just, yeah. She deserves better than what she got, for starters, and she has a lot of, like... I mean, everyone has a ton of baggage in this game, you know? <laughs> and her husband kind of sucks, and, uh... You know... She had to watch him, like, run off with someone else, and... Like, for, for 18 years. Which is, uh, painful. In the at the same time, she was continuing to work with him, so, like, got a close look at all of that. You know, wasn't able to move on or go get over it at all. By choice. Fair. But, you know, I, mm. She's had a, she's had a rough time. And she is very patient to wait that long. Very determined, and that probably got like that probably caused some issues. <laughs> like, it's not healthy, girl. And he's not worth it, he really is not worth it. But man, imagine that kind of like devotion, but given to someone who does deserve it. You know, we, it, could, it would be a completely different situation. She would not be contemplating murder in that situation. Just saying. Uh, plus, I'm pretty sure that 99% of the people on this island are in fact capable of murder, and that's kind of a plot point. Like, we've seen that when pushed hard enough, any of these people can just, you know, throw down. Wait, Kat, are you, are you saying that Kiria should hook up with Natsuhi? Because that's an interesting pairing. I could see that, that. That would be interesting. Um, also interesting is when Jessica walked up to Kiria, she was described as like leaning her head against a, you know, a cold window pane, thinking about, you know, trying to be strong to support her husband and that we've had that exact scene with Natsuhi at some point, at which point, Jessica walks in, and they have a meaningful conversation, just like here. So there's an interesting parallel there, and I'm not sure what purpose it serves, but it's there. They are both outsiders to the family, so maybe that's related. Maybe we're going to see the same scene with Hideyoshi at some point, leaning against the window pane. You know, trying to be strong for, for his wife. <laughs> And then Jessica walks in, <laughs> and they have a meaningful conversation. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay, I needed a little, you know, resting my voice break, but uh, I'm good to go again. To be fair, out of all the characters to say sup daddy -o, it would be Jessica. If anyone's capable, it's her. Until now, Kitty had never shown Jessica, no, she had never even shown Rudolph, that glint in the deepest depths of her eyes. It told plainly and clearly that romance and love are not the sweet and fluffy candies that young girls imagine them to be. Jessica was overwhelmed by that pressure and stunned silent, and she had to acknowledge it. This was the power of will that could make love be realized. This was the level of willpower Kitty showed in her support of Rudolph as his wife. And it was the same for George. He, al he already had the willpower to confront everything in the way of his love that transcended status, that transcended status, and he had proven that. Now, Jessica could clearly understand. This was the magnitude of George's determination. 
which had allowed him to coldly carry out his part in the demon's trial. Then, what about her? Did she really have the resolve to make her love with Kanon Bearfruit? And to go through with the task of harvesting it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I only meant to give a little advice, but perhaps I scared you a little too much. <laughs> Blame the weather. I just wanted to pressure you a bit, but I've gone overboard. Kitty let a relaxed smile arise to her face. The tense atmosphere finally slackened. However, her word, words had been gouged into Jessica's heart. I don't know what your love has been like, Jessica Chum. But if you have a rival and neither is willing to back down, you can't let yourself become complacent. If you do, you'll end up like me. Every woman should have one time in her life when she would kill for the sake of love. I can tell you that all women in the world who call themselves mothers have been through that. After all. Women who don't do that are chewed to bits by the others and forced to crawl through the hell of envy and regret for the rest of their lives. My hell lasted 18 years. I was lucky to be pardoned after just 18. That hell is still filled with women who will never get out till they die, unless they execute themselves in their regret. Wow, I... I have no words. <laughs> I was trying to spur you on, but here I've gone and frightened you too much. I'm truly sorry. Love could be much more easy going than that, okay? Love really is like playing with fire. Anyone can play easily and lightheartedly. But when you mess up and get burned, that scar stays with you your whole life. <laughs> she's so bitter I love her. And she's digging her own grave. <gasps> Regrets and love will never fade. That was all that Kitty had been trying to communicate. It wasn't like Kitty had to tell her life story instead of just saying something that like that directly. In fact, her past was a topic she usually avoided. However, Kitty might have felt as though Jessica deserved to hear. Jessica had timidly brought up the subject of love. Perhaps Kitty had opened up and told everything because she had seen the fires of Jessica's determination in her eyes. Well, I'd better head back. Let's keep with what we've talked about a secret, okay? <laughs> with a mysterious smile on her face, Kitty had turned around. I wonder if I scared her too much. Still, it's a hundred times better to learn of that hell from her warning. Once you've fallen into it, it's already too late. Good luck, Jessica Chan. Your love sounds like a handful, but don't let yourself be beat. <laughs> it's not every day I get to act as a mentor. Hmm. What is it, Jessica Chan? That spooked me. A windstorm grazed Kitty's head. It had missed by a hair. If Kitty hadn't twisted her body, body slightly, that fist would probably have, have been buried in her face by now. A bitter smile rose to Jessica's face when she saw that her first strike had failed to land a kill. Just so you know, I didn't try to sucker punch you because I'm a dirty coward. I'd hoped to end it with a single painless strike before you realized what was happening. Didn't I 
tell you that I've lived through the hell of je jealousy. I've come close to getting stabbed in the back a couple times before. I know how it feels just before a surprise attack. You mean you could sense it? That. Plus the lie you told in the beginning. A lie? Come now. If you had come from your room after picking up a book and were on your way back to the guest house, you wouldn't have come through this hallway in that direction. Chessboard theory led me to seven possible reasons you might have had for lying. And this was the worst case scenario. Telling a hasty lie to Kitty would only put her on her guard. If Jessica hadn't told that lie, her surprise attack would have succeeded. Not bad. I should have expected that from you, Aunt Kitty. Why me? You were planning to kill me from the beginning. It didn't matter who it was. Just my luck. It's what you said that gave me the boost I needed. Thanks a lot. Kitty had dodged the punch, placed her hand against that fist, and slammed it against the wall. Ordinarily, being made to punch the wall should have caused Jessica to hurt her own hand, and roll around clutching it in pain. However, Jessica's fist had left what looked like a meter-wide crater in the wall. Instead of a look of anguish after smashing her fist against the wall, Jessica clicked her tongue in irritation at having missed. Incredible. I see that you are your father's daughter. Have you taken a box in two? Impossible. Jessica's barehanded. She isn't holding any sort of weapon at all. Please don't resist, Aunt. Just one strike to the head. I promise you won't feel a thing. Kitty had tried to look confident, but she couldn't hide her confusion at this unreal destructive force. If that punch had hit, her head probably would have split open like Jessica had said, and killing her without any pain. Here I come. Kitty's kick off the ground and leap backward had been an instant slower, her gut would probably have been pulverized. Though she had avoided it by a hair, Jessica's left body blow was followed by a terrible tornado-like gust of wind which blew Kitty back. Is this a dream? Am I still sleeping? I, I don't understand. This Jessica looked like the normal Jessica, but something was different wasn't human and common sense didn't apply to it. This had to be some kind of nightmare. Kitty slowly stood up. Then, she looked at Jessica, noticed the several meters between them, and realized just how far that blast of wind had sent her flying. Feel free to hate me, but just like you. I can't back down. I can't let my love finish half-hearted. What are you talking about? What are you saying? What on earth is going on? Someone, tell me! The air around Jessica seemed to bend like a heat wave. It seemed to be enshrouding her fists, and it seemed as though something like a red magic circle had appeared beneath her feet. She looked just like a western demon standing amidst the flames of hell. Badass. Flame upgrade. Mass upgrade. Armor piercing upgrade. Each time Jessica muttered, 
Her fists were surrounded by a pulsating, sinister red light. Those fists, which were even giving off smoke, surely represented the iron hammers of hell wielded by demons. Goodbye! This is just a nightmare! Kitty had dashed away with lightning speed. Yes, right now, that was her best option. She was smart enough to realize that pinching her cheek wasn't the best way to make wake up from this nightmare, and by now, this came as no surprise. What are you? What's up, boy? Our boy's gonna help kill my queen. Oh no. When Jessica muttered once more, a blood-red magical barrier blocked off the corridor. Kitty slammed into it hard and realized that her path of, path of escape had been cut off. St stop this madness! This is... This is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. But wake up. Quickly. Yeah, this is a nightmare. I'll wake you up right now if that's what you want. Just one strike. Don't move. Jessica slowly stepped forward towards her, and shrouded in flames. Each time her feet lifted off the floor, boiling steam hung around her footprints. This was a true nightmare. Kitty had clutched her head in her hands shaking it over and over again. It's a nightmare, right? This is a nightmare, isn't it? Please, tell me it is. Yeah, it's a nightmare. It is, right? It's a nightmare, right? <laughs> I'll recognize that. This is a nightmare. I do too. I recognize that this is a nightmare, so please. I'll wake you up with a single punch. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> uh oh, that's a new voice. That's not a new voice. I, I can do Leviathan. Jessica's neck twisted at an odd angle, and she staggered backwards, her eyes rolled back into her head, as though she didn't have a clue what had just happened. The demon stake was buried at an angle into her forehead. It pulled itself out of her, spun around, then became Leviathan and landed. The hole left behind in Jessica's head spewed blood. Leviathan the Envious, right here. Uh, she should be more whiny. I'll fix that. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I should record these instead so I can redo lines, but, you know, then it would be like 300 hours worth of, you know, footage instead of like 100 ish. <laughs> so maybe not a good idea, you know? <laughs> oh boy. If this is inside a nightmare anyway, why not have the friend that shows up in my nightmares? My friend from the Hell of Envy. Thanks for showing up just in the nick of time. It's too early to thank me. She's not down yet. <laughs> Even though she had taken a deep gouge to the top of the head, Jessica just stood there, convulsing and white white eyed, and didn't fall over. 
the blood stopped pouring out of her head, and her blank, doll-like eyes returned. Then, she slowly pressed her own palm against the wound in her forehead. There was a sizzle, as though she had pressed a hot iron against it. It was easy to imagine that she was doing this to seal up the wound. If Kitia didn't escape now, there would never be another chance. Can you defeat her? Impossible. She has a contract with one of the great demons. She's immortal. That is because of a love. That is why she's immortal. Yes, love is magnificent. Those with our blessings cannot be killed. Can we break that magic red magic wall? I don't know if it's Sama is also a great demon. There's nothing I can do. Can we escape out of a window? The windows are not good either. They were blocked by Ronovisama's barrier a while ago. Incredible. Does this mean she sold her soul to demons for the sake of love? How could she make so many contracts with great demons? Ah, I'm so jealous. Armor upgrade. All tribute defense. Counter-attacking armor upgrade. In response to these words, this time her entire body pulsated with a red light. She had upgraded herself with a defensive power that would ensure the Vine's attacks would never work again. What is she talking about? Self-augmentation. It's a kind of enchantment. Right now, she has enough defensive power to prevent me from piercing her. And she even has the power to reflect damage back upon the attacker. She's no longer human, she's a monster. Oh, so that's all. Then not much has changed. <laughs> How can you say that? Her face made me laugh. I feel like that was probably not the face she should have been making. I don't know. It looked very strange. Just like in the very beginning, we still have no chance of winning. That hurt. But it won't work again. Jessica slowly lifted the hand that had been covering her forehead. There was no longer any hole there. The hall was blocked by barriers in both directions, and even the windows were sealed. There was no way out. Is the door to this room sealed? No, it's just locked. But it's just a normal room. It does have windows, but they've already been sealed. In other words, that's a locked room and a coffin for us. A coffin is just what I need. Unlock it. <sighs> I'm jealous. Why are you the only one who can unlock it? Leviathan's stake flew about at high speeds, ramming itself into the keyholes of that room. The tip of the stake had become a key. As soon as it was unlocked, the door flew open. Both of them fell into the room and quickly locked it. This was probably Krause's study. Its soothing furnishings brought about a sense of nobility that Krause would probably like. Even if you lock it, she could just smash through it with one punch. You've just put the lid on your own coffin. However, if she wants to send us a killing blow here inside this coffin, she'll have to take the lid off first. Hmm? With dim eyes, Jessica tilted her head upon hearing Kitty's words. What are you talking about? How will such a small room be able to protect you? This room may be a locked room. It may leave us with no method of escape. However, even if you can't break into this room, that's what a locked room is. 
However, even you can't break into this room. That's what a locked room is. What are you talking about? How does this tiny room, with its tiny door, make you think you've gotten away from me? With a confused expression on her face, Jessica looked wearily between her own burning fists and the door. Then, slowly, she sent that pulsating red light to her fists. She repeatedly enchanted her fists to give them their destructive power for the killing blow. I'll smash this door to bits. If you think you can, give it a try. Kirie! Responding calmly through the door, which was the only thing separating her from Jessica, Kirie placed a single index finger on it, as if to hold it shut. Jessica slowly raised a fire wreathed demonic fist. So long, Aunt Kirie. Kitty, yeah. Oh. Jessica's fist slammed into the door in slow motion. It was the same kind of slow motion often seen as a special effect at the climax of a movie. However, this was no special effect. Jessica's fist really was slowing down as though it was being sucked in like a spoon sinking into a jar of honey. That punch was no longer a punch. It was no more than a knock. I'm envious of you. Envy. I crawled through the hell of envy for 18 years because of my arrogance and naivete in love. So I envy you. I'm going to remember my word. Succeed in love and walk a beautiful life, friend. <sighs> I envy you. You'll get to live through the most beautiful time in a woman's life for a full 18 years longer than I did. I envy you so much. Jessica tried to slam her fists against the door against the door over and over again. However, as soon as her fist approached it, its speed plummeted. She could barely knock, much less smash the door. Speed upgrade. Instantaneous force upgrade. Speed of sound upgrade. It's useless, darling. Break. With full speed upgrades, Jessica's fist moved, moved at the speed of sound. 1225 kilometers per hour. However, how long had Jessica been in envy to gain that speed? She'd started to envy George and Shannon's relationship about two years ago? 2 times 365 equals 730 days. Oh no, numbers. Three, 730 times 24 equals 17,520 hours. However, she wasn't envious all the time. It only happened when George, when Shannon started going on about George. With Shannon shift on date, on about with Shannon shift on about <laughs> let's let's just start over. With Shannon shift on about three days of the week, divided by seven times three, and it wasn't as though she would go on about George all day long. Her fond words for him would only leave a mark on Jessica for about an hour, so only one twenty-fourth of each day. Seventeen thousand five hundred and twenty divided by seven times three divided by twenty-four equals three hundred and twelve. Round it down. 
The number of hours that Kitty had been jealous was... 100,057... Like... I never know how to say numbers in English. Especially the big ones. Goddamn. It was a lot, okay. I'm... I, this isn't my native language. I don't know how to... words. In other words, this was a scant 0.2% of the time that Kitty had been jealous. 157,680. Okay, thank you. That actually genuinely helps. Even 1225 kilometers per hour, the speed of sound becomes only 2.45 kilometers per hour in the... One out of 500 the world. I don't like numbers. Understand? You're lacking in both love and envy. Even Jessica's sonic fists were no faster than a walking child in Kitty's world. Jessica ground her teeth, her fists still pressed against the door. If someone could have seen this from both sides of the door, it would have looked as though Kitty was holding it shut with a single finger. Way to go, Kitty, eh? See? This room is a locked room. At most, Jessica Chan can knock, knock on the door, but she can't lay a finger on us inside. Ah. Beatrice's definition of a locked room. What the hell? Then, this locked room will be somewhat troublesome. It is impossible for a human to carry out a locked room murder. Only magic can do that. Until you truly understand magic, you will not be able to break through it. You can't corner me any further. As time passes, the relatives will eventually realize that I haven't returned, and they'll start searching the mansion. And then, you will be observed. Witches and magic alike disappear when they're observed. The nightmare is already over, darling. Damn it. Oh. I can't believe Jessica's going to drop out all of a sudden. Oh, please give it your all. Do it for your beloved cuddle. Come, Jessica. Believe in love and let us see a miracle. Let me make a correction. There isn't even any need to wait for time to pass. After all, there's an extension telephone right here. Of course, the internal line, the internal phone line hasn't been cut. I'll just pick up the receiver. This is my checkmate. Construction completed. Locked room, murder. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, that is valid. Permeation upgrade. Attack trans transmission. Indirect attack power upgrade. Huh. Jessica's fist, which was pressed against against the door, glowed red, and then white hot. Holy shit. Jessica didn't even swing her fist. She just kept kept it pressed against the door. However, Jessica's murder reached inside the locked room. Through the cracks in the study door, through the keyhole, burst the flames of hell. Jessica couldn't see what was happening inside the room. However, even here, on the other side of the door, she could tell that the flames of hell had swallowed the entire room. G G 
Kitty's smoldering death throes could be heard from across the door. Jessica clearly heard as Kitty had danced the dance of death and went to hand Hellfire, fell to her knees, and slumped over the, to the floor. Slowly, Jessica tore her burning fist away from the door. If you love the hell of envy so much, then burn. Burn in the flames of envy for all time. There are probably some things that could be learned from envy. However, it's nothing to be praised and it's no one's duty. It seems you were too proud after all, Aunt Kitty. A splendid locked room murder. Could you take care of the mess? I'd hate for a body to be burnt to a crisp when it's finally found. Do you think you could clean it up? As you wish, milady. I don't know if it transformed into a gold butterfly and entered Krause's study through the keyhole. Then, he had to cross his arms and think about how he would even start cleaning up Kitty's unrecognizable corpse in this room that had ended up as a burning hell. <sighs> Jessica finally left out the breath that she had been holding down in her chest. Her normal human glint finally returned to her eyes. And then, she couldn't help but shudder at what she had done. Even if it had been just a trial on the game board for the sake of her love. Is that what you wanted, demons? Yes! Well done, Jessica. Your love is the real deal. George welcomed Jessica with crisp applause. Beato timidly tried to join him, but Jessica yelled at them and she stopped. It's just something that happened on the game board. There's no need to look so sad about it. I know that logically, but still, how, how am I supposed to just accept it emotionally? My lady. Come on, Kun. I love you. I can't give up. That's why I've shown how strong my feelings are. I d did do something wrong, did I? I'm not wrong, am I? <laughs> my lady. As Jessica started to sob, Conan held her quietly. And he realized that he would have to carry on the determination she had shown him. You didn't make any mistake. And it also isn't a mistake to keep your human heart and be sad. I just happen to be a bit more of a stoic when it comes to that sort of thing. Jesus, Shannon. Not everyone can match up to George Summer's level. But, in any event, you've completed your trial, my lady. Well done. I admire the strength of your determination. Very true. Both George and Jessica have splendidly succeeded just the same. Very impressive, Jessica. That locked room murder just now was wonderful enough to, e to fascinate even a witch like myself. Jessica had used magic to kill Kitty, who had holed up inside a closed room. In that instant, Jessica had constructed a locked room murder, had it acknowledged by the demons and raised it to the level of magic. The trials for the two of you have been completed. So then, who will take the next challenge? Will it be Beatrice Sama? No, no, it might be Shannon. No, this has to be Kanon's time to shine. Come, speak up. Who is next? Who will take the next trial? Hmm. 
What witch would hesitate at committing murder on the game board? Even excess shyness can kill love. Come, who will be next? To carry out a murder of love. The three who remained looked at each other. If the other two are going to spend a few more moments hesitating to raise their hands, I will raise my own instead. All three thought this at the same time. But Hey Chris, thank you for the raid. Uh, welcome everyone. How are you doing? How is your stream? Uh, I'm gonna start you guys off with a content warning because uh, you're gonna need it. Uh, content warning for this game is character deaths, detailed descriptions of gore and body horror, child abuse, discussions and mention of suicide and misogyny. Uh, yeah, things get really serious. Um, people uh, die. People die. People have just died, actually. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are also in... The sixth chapter out of eight of a series that spans a million words. So, I can't even begin to explain what's going on here, unless you, you know... You witness the death of a leader? What does that mean? Oh no, what happened? Yeah, it's a... Uh, fun fact, um, this series is longer than uh, War and Peace, which is f well known for being a very long series of books. Is it a series or is it one book? I can't remember. I know they do like multiple book editions. But yeah, it's, it's longer by, than that by quite a bit, actually. But we're over the halfway point. And I'm gonna finish the whole series, and then there's gonna be a ninth chapter at some point that's gonna be translated. And, uh, that means even more words. And I will read every single one of them. Or try to. I skip a few here and there, because I can't read. Uh, also for cats specifically, I hope you're still taking notes and stuff because the, this episode is specific. There's so many clues. There's so many clues. Speedrun it. Uh, th honestly, this is me speedrunning it. I c could not possibly go any faster. <laughs> I would love to be able to narrate and talk quicker, but... You haven't been taking notes? That's fair. Uh, it's true though. There's a lot of... Oof, there's a lot of clues in this one. In this entire episode, actually, it's just rife with clues. Um, that's all I can say. I don't want to spoil anything, you know. Especially not for the people who've been trying to keep up. So... It's been an eye-opener. Okay, I, will, I would love to hear about that more later. Um... Uh, okay, okay, nice. I'm just uh, taking this opportunity to, you know, hydrate. Um, I took a little break from streaming, so my voice is really, uh, having a rough time. It's gonna take some practice before I'm back at like, I can read for two hours in a row without feeling any discomfort levels, you know? But uh, it is what it is. I'll get, it'll get better. Also, I, I, I made a new emote, just so you guys know. I hope you all like it. Hmm. Yeah, that specific locked room, room murder, murder is an interesting one. For reasons I cannot uh, say without spoiling anything. 
But yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I kind of get where you're going with this already. All right, I'm gonna mute myself for a second cough. There we go. And then I'm gonna continue. So they all had the thought at the same time, and so they all raised their hands at the same time. The ones they loved had already shown their determination. They had to carry on. I, should... I did the same thing again where I stopped two sentences before the end of a chapter. Rosa could be seen in the parlor. It seemed that the relatives all wanted to be alone now that they, <clears throat> alone now that, that they had dispersed for a short break. Blech. Since everyone had avoided the parlor, the obvious place for people to gather, Rosa was able to have this relaxing and comforting room all to herself. That didn't mean she looked relaxed. Her, exp uh, her expression was heavy with gloom and weariness. The cup of black tea that she had brought from the dining hall had gone stone cold. Comforting silence. Now that no one else was in sight, Rosa's heart finally awoke. She was always treated like a kid in the conferences with her three siblings. She had no influence at all. But, possibly because of that, she was apparently considered to be a neutral party. The siblings would often ask for her agreement, sometimes even treating her like an... Adjudi I don't know how to pronounce that. Adjudicator or a judge? I'm guessing. I have to make use of that. And turn the discussion in the direction I want. I have to find almost a hundred million yen by March. That was supposed to be my great commitment, a burden I bore to help support his business. Now I'm not sure anymore. If I can pay off the debt, will he call me again? Well, you can forget it. Even if you do contact me after all this time, I'll be the one turning you down. But still, you are Maria's father, you know. Please come and see her. If only just once. Love is quite a difficult thing to stick to, isn't it? Huh? Who? Though no one should have been in the parlor. Someone s suddenly spoke to Rosa, and she jumped. Just when had it happened? Conan could be seen standing there. Even considering that she had been deep in thought, to think that she hadn't noticed him at all. You scared me. I'm sorry, I guess I was thinking so hard that I didn't notice you. Need something? No. The reason you are currently in pain is because of love, Rosa-sama. Am I wrong? That's sudden. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Maria-sama's father asked you to be the co-signer on a loan, and you accepted. What a troublesome kid. You were listening to Kraus Nissan from the hallway, weren't you? True. Earlier this day, in this very room, Kraus had seen through to the fact that Rosa was bearing a massive debt because she had become a co-signer on a loan. However, he hadn't said that her partner had been Maria's father. Why did Connell know so much?
You are a very wise person, Rosasama. You wouldn't have become a co-signer without thinking carefully about the consequences. I hadn't yet moved to his family register, but I thought of the man I would soon marry as my partner. If he couldn't borrow the money without my name, I figured that helping him out was my responsibility as his future wife. And did that future ever come? No, it hadn't. So afterwards, Rosa was always alone. And Maria never had a father. However, time moved on. Maria, who should have been a symbol of their reunion, their union, just kept growing. Almost like a living hourglass measuring the length of the hell Rosa had crawled through. Because of that, Maria's growth hurt. It's a cruel joke. I tried to forget that man several times. But, you know, forgetting him doesn't get rid of that debt. It was only natural. And so, whether or not she forgot her love, she had to do all she could to pay that money back. But, you know, I also think of it this way. If I can manage to pay everything off, it'll mean that I've passed the trial of love that he gave me. If I have to pass off my debt and pay off my debt anyway, how can I abandon my reward, the love I could gain as a result, before it's over? Don't you think I could put off thinking about that until after I've paid it all back? <laughs> It may have been a trick of words that only those who have suffered through love could understand. Even Rosa vaguely realized that she might have been deceived. Might have been? Might have been. Girl. However, if she was able to succeed in paying back the loan, he might acknowledge her usefulness as a wife. <sighs> Keep in mind, right? We are hearing this right after basically having it confirmed from both Kitty and Jessica, who at no point says, like, wait, what the fuck are you saying? So, you know, it's still true that in this time, in this setting, uh, women are not supposed to be involved in financial decisions. So I imagine that would include, you know, co-signing a loan. So, seeing this as sort of like a, oh yeah, this is a thing for a wife to do, that's super not common or like expected or that's just not really a thing that people would generally consider here, you know? Oh boy. <laughs> And, I don't know, this feels like this is deliberately in here to show us just how duped Rosa was. Victim of daylight robbery, you're right. Anyway. Uh, this is why we have the misogyny of content warning, yay. When that happened, she might be able to regain her love. Girl, no. <laughs> But if she had already abandoned that love, then what? This debt, this trial that he had given her, would become completely meaningless. Yes. For her, the debt itself appeared to be a trial of love. In fact, the very fact that she looked at it that way might have been her blindness due to love as well as proof that she still hadn't cast off her infatuation with the past. Even now, she still suffered. And that suffering would continue, at least until she paid back the massive loan and let a good deal of time pass after that. 
until she could finally lay her feelings for him to rest. Could this be the hell that Kiriyasama spoke of? Probably. Though I'm not sure what you're talking about. There's no doubt that my world has been a total hell. And how can that be put to an end? Who knows? If anyone did, the disease called love would never eat into anyone again. That disease is a, is a serious one. It sometimes eats into a person for their entire life, spreading to and hurting the people closest to them. That disease was torturing her now as much as it ever had. Well, since you bring up Kiryasan, her story is like an aspiration to me, or a dream. Though she had her man stolen from her, she persevered for 18 years. She never fell to despair, and instead continued to support Rudolph, lying in wait for a miracle. I mean, I, I get why these two characters are being highlighted right now, because, yeah. This is a very depressing episode, I didn't realize that beforehand. Marie is still only nine years old. I've only waited for the first half of Kiryasan's 18 years. <laughs> if I gave up just after, after just this, she would laugh at me. Do you think that a miracle will occur in another nine years? Doubting that would be the end of me. In a sense, I'm a ghost. I'm already dead. I'm just living on without noticing. A ghost waiting for eternity for a person who will never come. That's right. That day, when I had naively said that I wanted to support his dream, I was probably already dead. I guess that really was a regretful day in the end. I have dreams. I want to go overseas. I'll fly out of this tiny country, make it big, and come back to you. <sighs> that takes me back. At that time, I thought of lovers as, lovers as a pair of people willing to acknowledge the other's radical dreams. I'd become a successful designer, Announcing my new lines in Paris. Getting jostled by the press. He loved to talk about that dream. And I loved... And I loved listening to him. When I think about it, I really had my head in the clouds during that strange time. We both lifted the other up, as though we were drifting about in the air. So, when he said he wanted to get out of Japan, I applauded him and promised to support him. Acknowledging each other's great dreams that might never be is a standard sort of pillow talk for lovers. But once they started to translate into actual action, from that point on, I should have been serious and practical. For a long time, I felt proud of letting him go on that day. No, I still do. But you still regret it. That's right. If, on that day, I had sobbed and pleaded for him to stay, I might not have fallen into hell. Did seeing him off with a smile really make me a winner? Of course not. I basically lost my def default by refusing to fight when the time came. I only glorified that loss, saw him off with a smile as he went, went to take on the world overseas. I became intoxicated with the fantasy that I was some brave woman waiting patiently with her daughter for her man's return. Even though he never called, called me once after that, and the mail sent to the address he gave me back came back forwarding address unknown. 
Rosa. Rosa. You got you got robbed. Like for not robbed, I guess, but like Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh yeah, maybe I'll come back someday and like everything will be <sighs> No, girl. She just got scammed by some random dude. Ugh. I actually forgot that this part happened. I So now I'm feeling like bad for her all over again. Oof. If you fought, you would have just found another person to scam. I... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and she's in complete denial about it too. Uh, okay. I got this. I can do this. <laughs> Don't get distracted. I've even dragged my daughter into hell with me. I wish someone would just kill me. I want to be told that I've already been killed. That I'm a ghost. In love, if you do not fight, you fall into hell. Yes, love is a fight. Will you win in the game? Or lose and die? But please, have no fear of death. After all, it is a peaceful sleep. What is truly terrifying is the hell that finds the unsleeping ghost who could neither win nor die. That hell has no end. The battle of love is cruelest to those who could neither win nor die. So, in love, you've got to go for broke. Dying in battle is better than the alternative. They say the most torturous toxin for humans is made from rotting, rotting love. The suffering it brings exceeds the tortures of the most twisted hells. She said this as a warning to motivate her double and little sister, encouraging her to take on any trial, no matter how severe. I, I understand. After all, when my desire to have battle or some one day accept me wells up in my chest, I can feel the seed that resides there. It is up to me to kill that seed or make it bud. But if I let it, let it rot here in my chest, its poison will surely torment me forever. And that, even for us thousand-year-old witches, is the most terrifying torture in the world. Behold what happens to those who make light of love. This hell of roses is what happens to those who do not possess, possess the courage to make the seed of love bud and instead allow it to rot. One cannot end, end that pain by their own hands. Just now, was that a red light? My apologies. Huh? What? Just now, I thought I saw something strange. I wonder if I'm tired. Probably just my imagination. Rosa picked up her cup of cold tea. 
When she did, she saw a small red rose petal floating on the surface. Uh, Rose? I have heard that in your youth, you love to lie on that sofa. It wasn't a rose petal. It was a drop of blood that had fallen from Rose's eyes. In an instant, Conan had beautifully and precisely cut just the single thread of Rose's life. There was no wound on Rose's body. There were only the few drops of blood that dripped down from her eyes. Her pain, her uncertainties, and her worries were all gone now. Slowly, she collapsed onto the sofa and lay there. That had been one of her most blissful habits during the most blissful time of her life. Sleep well, Rosa Summer. Your hell has ended. Conan took a blanket out of a cupboard and gently covered Rosa with it. It would have looked to anyone, just as though Rosa was sleeping peacefully. Those demons had not exaggerated when speaking of love as a battle and a trial. In fact, although cruel, this could even be said to be an honest reflection of reality, in the sense that it made no attempt to hide the fact that to lose in love is to die. Now my part is complete. Were you watching, demons? What? Is that a cliffhanger I spot? Is that a cliffhanger? Yes, that's a cliffhanger. Let's go. We're gonna end it there. I, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Where's my menu? There's my menu. I'm doing it. It is uh, after midnight. If I go on much longer, I'm gonna hurt myself, so I. Re yeah. Not a good idea. Can't believe Rose isn't going without a fight. Oh boy. Remember those words next time. I won't say why. Um, alright. Let's see. Okay, so, uh, now that I'm back from my break, I'm gonna be on my regular schedule. Which means, next Wednesday, we are going to be back with more Imaneko. It's gonna be... <laughs> It's gonna be an exciting one, as you can tell from the massive fucking cliffhanger. And hopefully, reading's gonna get more easy over time. So we'll have to take less, like, you know, water breaks, basically. And then the episodes will get a little longer, it'll speed up a little bit. Not in a bad way, but, you know. I've, uh, I've slowed down a lot over the, over time, and it's, uh... It's, just, it's gotten worse today, let me just put it that way. But yes, we're back. I'm ready to go. And... Uh, I said it last time, but this episode, this arc is one of my favorites. It's genuinely very good. Um, is it one of my favorites? It's not one of my favorites. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> I just- there are parts that I really enjoy.
And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that you're here and that you're you're enjoying it. Kat, thank you so much for, for showing up for these and for following along. And I, I wasn't able to respond to all the comments, but uh, I, I appreciate them and I saw everyone. Also, Chris and Laura, I don't know if you're still there, but thank you so much for popping in and for the raid and just for being really cool people. I hope you all have a, a good night and stuff. I'm gonna turn off this music now and switch over to my end screen. Because <laughs> this is a little too intense for signing off. Uh, I saved this. Yes. Okay, let's go. I'll put on a, something a little more ch No, that's not chill at all. That's not chill either. There's a lot of not chill songs on this soundtrack. There we go. That's that's good. I think. All right. So yes, back again next week. Back again on Monday as well. Um, yield schedule. It's you know, we're back. I'm gonna have this episode up on YouTube um, as soon as humanly possible. Probably by the weekend. I have quite a bit to do the next few days, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it done. Um, and there will be another fun fact, um, for those of you who don't know, every YouTube video has a fun fact about the series. Uh, except for one, where I couldn't think of any. <laughs> um, so yes, if you want to know what the plank of Carnatus is, I can't read my own handwriting, that's gonna be in there. Also very good if you're like, you know, theorizing and all that jazz. And um, I, I would recommend that you rewatch this one, maybe. <laughs> I This feels like self-advertisement, but I'm really just advertising for the story. Because, oh boy, this one is an intricate one. I actually have a lot to say about like the themes and stuff for this specific episode, like what we played today, but I'll, I'll spare you guys for now, because it's gonna come up more and more over time. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be it for me for today. Thank you all so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for watching uh, on Twitch or watching the VOD or the YouTube video, whichever it is. Uh, I'm glad I get to share the story with, with people and that people enjoy it. Because it's so freaking good. And, um... Yeah. Have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good week. See you next time. Bye-bye.